The Egyptian temple was one of ancient Egypt's most powerful institutions, often more powerful than the royal court. The temple as an institution was more than a religious center. It served as a hub of economic, social, and even educational activity. Let us attempt here to discover the inner workings of the Egyptian temple and reveal how its influential status in society came to be. After the unbelievably ancient stone circles at Nabta Playa, which may be the oldest extant religious structures in Africa, we can observe the remains of a cult temple at Neken, dating to the proto-dynastic period. As we shall see, even this far back, principles of Egyptian temple architecture were being established. The temple complex here was a courtyard surrounded by a mud-covered reed fence, with a tall pole bearing an image of the falcon god, probably Horus, on the far east side. On the north side of the complex were a number of small buildings, probably workshops, which faced the shrine itself on the opposite side. This sloping shrine mimicked the shape of the bandage-wrapped bird used in writing the word Nekeni, meaning God of Neken. This shrine was also fronted by multiple massive flagpoles. By the time the kings of Egypt favored to be buried in so-called mastabas at Saqqara, they would erect cenotaphs at the sacred site of Abydos. Near these cenotaphs were walled enclosures surrounding a symbolic mount, and cult gods of Egypt's various regions would make journeys to these sacred places. In the Old Kingdom, the most important developments in temple architecture and symbolism took place in the pyramid and sun temples built for the funeral cults of the 4th and 5th dynasty kings. The pyramid temples comprised a valley temple, which had access to the Nile, and a mortuary temple at the base of the pyramid. These two structures were connected by a long, walled causeway. By the reign of King Khafre, the mortuary temple's basic layout was as follows. An entrance hall followed by a broad columned court which gave access to the inner sanctuary and the storage chambers in the rear. The sun temples of the 5th dynasty also followed this basic design. Middle Kingdom temples were mostly destroyed or absorbed into later complexes, but what has survived shows that stone remained the favored building material, and a symmetrical design was preferred. After this we get the New Kingdom, when the classic Egyptian temple design is established. This included an entrance fronted by two massive pylons hosting flagpoles, followed by a peristyle court, the furthest point in the temple that the common people were allowed access to. Followed by this was a broad hypostyle hall, with a forest of massive columns. Beyond this was the inner sanctuary, with an offering hall, bark chapel, and shrine. But the New Kingdom Temple is far more than a religious construction. It was, in many ways, a microcosm of Egyptian society as a whole. The king would make regular visits to the temple, and everything done here was done in his name and on his behalf. His images and statues asserted his authority and strength. The king endowed temples not only with new monuments such as colossi and obelisks, but also with vast tracts of land. Thus, the temple, with lands for agriculture, vineyards, gardens, mines, and quarries, became the center of its local economy. These lands were rented to the peasantry, who worked the land and paid up to one-third of their harvest to the temple. Through endowments and renovations, the kings of Egypt were able to assert their piety and outperform their predecessors. The high priesthood of a given temple might even grow powerful enough to assert their will over the pharaohs, as happened at the end of the 18th dynasty. Finally, through festivals and activities, the temple acted as a social hub for the common people of Egyptian society. The outer courtyard contained many statues of private individuals, allowing the common people to give them offerings and connect with their ancestors in a public fashion. The outer temple precincts also served as Egyptian society's hub of artisanry and craftsmanship, and contained the Pur Ankh, or House of Life, where elector priests read, studied, and copied the most important of Egyptian literary works. This was a center for learning in other fields as well, such as astronomy, magic, art, and medicine. The temple thus contained and fostered nearly every important aspect of Egyptian culture, and reinforced the class divisions between royalty, the priesthood, and the peasantry. The temple also acted as a microcosm of the universe as a whole, according to the Egyptian worldview. The most widespread creation myth taught that a mound arose from the primeval waters of existence. This idea came to be because of the importance of the Nile's annual inundation to the ancient Egyptians. The temple complex served as a symbolic representation of this primordial state of creation. If you recall, the first Egyptian shrine at Abydos was centered around a mound, which probably represented this primordial mound of order. In the developed state of the New Kingdom Temple, the main building was surrounded by mud-brick walls which undulated in a wave-like pattern, symbolizing the primordial waters. The temple's floor level gradually rose upward, and the ceiling gradually lowered. This way, the inner sanctuary acted as the primeval mound, and the stairs and ramps leading up to the sanctuary were in the shape of the hieroglyph representing Ma'at itself. The floor thus represented the Great Marsh, and the hypostyle hall's columns, carved to represent papyrus, lotus, or palm plants, represented the marshland vegetation. 
This effect was maximized in those temples designed in such a way that the pillared hall and outer courts would be flooded in the annual inundation of the Nile. The roof represented the heavens of this primordial world and was thus decorated with stars. Just as these elements of the temple's design symbolized the world's original creation, other elements represented the ongoing function of the cosmos by referencing to the sun's daily journey across the sky. The two outer pylons form the shape of the hieroglyph Akat, meaning horizon, and because the temple is oriented to the east, the sun would lower between these two pylons and travel along the main processional way of the temple, finally setting in the west, where the inner sanctuary was situated. Symbols of the heraldic plants of Upper and Lower Egypt, the lily flower and papyrus reed respectively, were placed on the north and south sides of the temple so as to reinforce this east-to-west journey motif. The effect created by all of these design decisions must have been truly incredible. Passing through the gigantic, white limestone-covered twin pylons gleaming in the sun, and through the open peristyle court, one would feel a sense of grandeur and awe, which would diminish as one passed through gradually darkening doors and halls of columns and into the heart of the temple. In this dark room with the golden image of the god and the smell of incense, the outside world would feel miles away, and an otherworldly tranquility would take over. If you reverse this journey, one would sense a feeling of revelation, as the god's dim sanctuary grew into the open world beyond, as if it had all been created on the spot. The image of the temple as a center of order and stability was, however, mainly perpetuated by the daily activities of the priesthood. Twice every day, once in the morning and once in the evening, the temple's high priest would break the seal of the door to the god's shrine and recite hymns while prostrating before it. He would then circle around the shrine with sensings and perform the presentation of Ma'at on behalf of the king. This involved offering a figurine of the goddess Ma'at to the deity, which signified the king's acknowledgement and affirmation of his duty to maintain order in Egypt. After this ritual, the image of the god was brought out of the shrine and was cleansed, anointed, and adorned with new clothes and jewelry. Then a large meal containing meats, fruits, vegetables, wine, milk, honey, water, and beer was offered to the god. In the evening, the process was repeated, and the deity was returned to the shrine, which was then closed. As the priest retreated from the sanctuary, he swept away his footprints so evil could not approach the god. In regards to the types and organization of priests, the situation is a bit more complex than was led on earlier. There was no separate class of priests until New Kingdom times. In the Old and Middle Kingdoms, most priests were state officials organized into rotating companies which served in the temple for several months of the year. The overseer of the temple would appoint individuals to lower roles, and the inspector of the temple was in charge of maintaining its daily operations. For most of ancient Egyptian history, priests were divided into two classes, the hem Netjer, or God-servant priests, who were granted access to the inner sanctuary, and the purification priests, who were not. Before the New Kingdom, many women from well-to-do families served as Hemet Nedjer, appropriately translated as priestess. These women largely served in the cults of female deities, and were likely responsible for many of the same duties as their male counterparts. There were also several types of specialist priests, such as the earlier spoken of lector priests, who recited formulas when certain rituals were performed. Sem priests wore the famous leopard skin and sidelock wig, and were responsible for funerary rites such as the opening of the mouth ceremony. The high priesthood presided over all these ranks. They were usually appointed by the king, but this role had a tendency to become hereditary, and this had disastrous consequences in later Egyptian history. All priests were held to rigid standards of purification. By the new kingdom, all priests were initiated by taking vows of purity and obedience. They were required to shave their heads and bodies and to wash themselves twice each day and twice each night. Priests were directed to chew natron, a type of salt used in mummification, to maintain inner purity. They were also only allowed to wear clean linen clothing. Herodotus claimed that the Egyptians were religious beyond measure, more than any other people, and he was not merely referring to this priestly caste. The common people often had shrines to minor household deities or ancestors within their homes, but they also dedicated votive offerings, ranging from beads to large statues, to divine temples, not to mention the very frequent festivals celebrated by the laity. These people took their relationship with the gods and temples very seriously, illustrated by the fact that many temples have shallow grooves scraped into the walls by devout individuals wishing to take with them a small portion of this holy place. I hope that you, by viewing this video, have also been able to take away a small part of the depth of power and meaning possessed by the ancient Egyptian temple.